Good morning. Welcome to the Deep 404. It's uh, Monday morning, 19th of February. There are new fronts opening up, new areas of conflict and war to be considered uh, after the collapse of the Ukrainian front in Avdiivka over the weekend. We have had reports from the Russian Defence Minister Sergei Shoigu to President Putin, where he has announced that there has been a complete Russian capture of the township of Avdiivka. Uh, this is a significant loss for Ukraine in terms of PR and messaging. Uh, the story around Avdiivka has changed from it being a strategic stronghold, vital to the fort, uh, sorry, vital to the fight, an iconic township which has been involved for ten years in the conflict um, since the Donbass regions, uh, the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics began to fight for the independence. Um, Avdiivka was one of those townships which was involved in that, and it has been involved in the shelling of Donetsk City throughout that period of time. So losing it is a big, uh, big failure for Ukraine in terms of morale. Um, a lot of the men along the front line will have heard of this, of course, now, and you know, they, they, their morale will drop after such a loss because it was considered to be a very fortified location. Um, it's also a, a loss for the new commander... Uh, General Zersky, his first real operation in the new role, and within days it had collapsed. And this is a this is a failure for him and Zelensky because the outgoing commander Zaluzhny, General Zaluzhny, had months ago said that it was time to pull out of Avdiivka. It was a lost cause. Uh, the Ukrainians would not be able to hold it, and that they should instead focus on building defensive positions. Now, this seems to be coming back now, perhaps to bite the Ukrainian ground forces uh, with reports that their preparations and fortifications has not been done to the extent it should have been, that there may have been corruption in the funding given to local contractors to do such things, and some of that preparation work hasn't occurred. Now, whether that is a um, an indication of what we are seeing on the map in terms of... I'll just go to the map here in terms of the last 24 hours, but there certainly are reports now that west of uh, Avdivka, we just go to our map here, this is Donetsk city, Avdivka to the northwest, that Lastochne, this small, small uh, settlement here, just to the west of Avdivka, there are reports that this is now falling under Russian control. Ukrainian forces are building and preparing defences along this Semenivka and Berichi roadway, reportedly, uh, trying to ultimately stop the Russians from breaking through to Novoprokrovost here and to Oshetne. Uh, from there, of course, they will look to move on to Pokrovost over here and uh, here in the Seldovi, if they you know, if they start to cut these major roads and take some of these major areas around here, then what happens is they look to then join up with the forces moving up from South Donetsk. And we are getting reports in a number of areas are along the Zaporozhye region. This is appearing to become the focus now for the Russian forces. Um, the Varemka Ledge here, now this was an important area in the Ukrainian offensive last year where they managed to make some ground pushing down from uh, Velka Novosilka here down through Neskuchne, Storozhev, um, Makarivka, getting their way right down here uh, to Urozhina. Uh, now they are being pushed back and it looks that if this continues uh, that these gains made by the Ukrainians will be lost. Um, and then, as I say, as locations like uh, Velika Novoselica become taken, you can see how it's sort of a, if I zoom in a little bit, you can see how it's sort of a hub with a number of roadways running into it. As those roadways are cut, that reduces the ability then for Ukraine to support other areas. You know, Konstantin uh, Minopol here, um, 
as you know, M- M- Marinka falls as the Russians work their way up here. This will continue on an approach towards Dnipro and Zaporozhia. Now, other areas in Zaporozhia where we're seeing this fight um, change direction now with the Russians advancing. The other big area of advance for the Ukrainians during the conflict last year, and really the the point of what was their uh, whole offensive was to break through here from Orkiv, go down to Tokmak. You can see a Tokmak again, a hub. And from Tokmak to Melitopol, and then from Melitopol to the Black Sea, and cut off this area and cut off Crimea. And that was going to make Crimea into a bargaining chip for Ukraine to say to the Russians, OK, we can stop fighting now, but we take Crimea or we bargain with it. That didn't happen. The Ukrainian forces were unable to get to Tokmak. Um, they were able to get down to Robotny and Novopropokivka here and Verbova. At Verbova is the one point where the Ukrainian forces were able to actually reach but not breach what was called the Surovikan line, which was part of the Russian large heavy defensive preparations. And there were multiple lines back here uh, before you got to Tokmak, for example. Now, there are some reports today from Zaporozhye. I'll just read this as coming from a Ukrainian channel. The airborne forces of the Russian Federation advanced two kilometres into the depth in the area of the villages of Robotino and Verbova. This is Robotny and Verbova in the Zaporozhye region in less than 48 hours. So two kilometre advances in short periods of time like that aren't good for the for the um, party that is on the defence. Uh, we saw that yesterday with Avdiivka, uh, where the Russians pushed from the outskirts of Avdiivka to Lastochne, and that's about a two kilometre gain. Um, here reports that the Russian forces have been able to move two kilometres in this region around Robotny and Verbova. So just to give you an idea, Robotny, that's about two kilometres. So it's about this, this much room on this scale has been claimed around these areas. Um, Going on, just continuing with this report from the uh, Telegram channel, the armed forces of Ukraine do not have time to prepare defence lines and have a problem with ammunition as weather conditions affect its supply. So here, I imagine what they are speaking of is that in order to get to the frontline troops, the Russians have artillery and some level of FPV drone control over the approach roads or the supply road into their positions. The weather conditions are bad. The winter has complete, it's completing. Uh, it's becoming wet and muddy. We saw around Avdiivka some of the footage there. Once you get off the sealed roads, if you're trying to tra- travel with heavy vehicles, your dirt roads rapidly turn to mud. So I imagine this is what they're suggesting here. Similar things. The main supply road, the Russians have it covered, forcing resupply to move onto the dirt roads and go through fields, and they are being bogged down in mud. Uh, Finally, the report says, as a result, their artillery almost does not work. So the Ukrainian artillery is not receiving shells. Uh, the hunger is also felt for cluster munitions. So the Russians not being impeded by cluster munitions to the level they were previously. And the work of suicide FPV drones is weak, almost non-existent. Again, the FPV drones, these are being chewed through at an enormous rate. Um, there are reports of thousands of these a day being chewed through on the front lines. Then being sent up, they're exploding into a target and another one is needed straight away. So again, if they are being shipped into these positions for the Ukrainians around Robotny and Verbova, if the supplies aren't able to reach them, then those frontline Ukrainian positions are now unprotected. Already they have very little air defence, and we're getting you know, multiple reports during the course of a week of Strela air defence systems being destroyed by the Russians. They have no close air support. The Ukrainian Air Force is, for all intents, not flying, apart from some strikes using SU-34 um, for fighter bombers launching storm shadows, which is happening infrequently, maybe once a month. But in terms of frontline protection, it's just not happening. Uh, even helicopter support is reduced to next to nothing and now they're being starved of ammunition already they were under low ammunition levels the ukrainian forces were reportedly firing between one and two thousand shells per day 
across the entire front line, with reports of the Russians firing upwards of 10,000, perhaps 20,000 a day. Now it seems in this area here in Zaporozhye, the starvation is even worse for, for shells. So we can see all those factors combining, um, the Russians having close air support, having shells, the Russians having the ability to travel over um, roadways, uh, paved roadways, and not suffering from the same problems with resupply, definitely at an advantage here. So the Zaporozhye front is one where we're seeing things open up, not only in Vremka Ledge, but here in Robotne, and also here, around Kamyatsk. So this is the area just to the very west of the Nova Khakhovka Reservoir, just below Zaporozhye itself. The Russians are here. The distance from here to the outskirts of Zaporozhye, only 25 kilometers. Uh, within another five or six kilometers advance, the, the outskirts of Zaporozhye will be well within Russian artillery range. Now, that's their general artillery range. The Russians have some pieces. Um, the coalition, uh, which is a larger self-propelled piece, it will put Zaporozhye in range already. If there's one of those in this area, then Zaporozhye is already in range. Um, so we are seeing uh, advances by the Russians in this area here. We're also hearing talk about attacks on Nikopol. Now, if you remember that this is no longer water, this is an old Google map, hasn't been updated because of the conflict, so as not to give away information. But what is actually running through here now is just a river, a thin river snaking through here, like, like this up here in, Zap in the Zaporozhye region, not a large reservoir. So what was five kilometres of water, which would have required a marine or amphibious approach to get across, it's now a, a dried out bed, which has had the summertime to dry out, it has the winter time to freeze, and possibly a 100 metre um, crossing would exist around this area now if you needed to get across the river. So that becomes achievable for the Russians who will be looking to take Zaporozhye or if not take Zaporozhye, bypass Zaporozhye on its eastern flank, heading up past Zaporozhye towards Nitropetrovsk, but cutting the supply lines as they go. But I think the Russians also looking to want to begin to get over the Dnieper River. We've, um, there's the Nova Kharkovka Dam here, which has been destroyed, but could be repaired to allow vehicle access. No need to stop the water running underneath, just build something that will support vehicles to go across. And there has been this row of strikes along the Kherson region, uh, in behind the Kherson uh, front line, over the river. And my suggestion is that all of these attacks along here are looking towards finding a way for the Russians to hop over the Dnieper River safely, perhaps look to cut supply lines around uh, Krivia Rog, which then frees up this area and starts to cut supply lines into Mikolaev. The Russians, I believe, will need to take Mikolaev, the the estuary from Mikolaev down to the Black Sea here is quite thick. Um, the Russians would very, be very exposed trying to cross here. I think they may work to cut supply lines around Mikolaev because apart from Krivorog here, there aren't great areas of resupply and defence. So they cut these roads, then they can move down to the coastline and take Odessa. Once they've taken Odessa, that then stops the threat of sea drones to the Black Fleet, and that will be an important consideration. The Russians, I'm sure, have had enough embarrassment of their naval craft being destroyed by five or $50,000 sea drones. So that's one big front that we're seeing things open up on. Now, as we move away from Ukraine, we have other ones opening up here. Um, Armenia, if we just look here at the, the map here, so here's Turkey in the pink, Iran, importantly, down here in the uh, sort of mauve color. This is Russia in this uh, sort of dark, in this uh, sort of light greenish kind of color, and Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. Now, Armenia is very important because of its proximity to Iran and what has been happening in the last six months or so in Armenia. And there have been some, some major changes in Armenia. The, the leadership there, the Prime Minister, Denis Pashinyan, has made the decision to do two major things last year. 
One of them was to relinquish the Nagano-Karabakh area. Um, so this map here, again, this is Armenia in the green and Azerbaijan in the yellow or gold. This green area in here is the Nagano-Karabakh area. It was disputed territory of Armenia. In a sort of surprising move last year, the uh, Prime Minister of Armenia made the announcement that Nagano-Karabakh was actually Azerbaijan land and should be considered that way. This led to the rapid retaking of the Nagano-Karabakh area by Azerbaijan. Now, this was considered by many people surprising and um, there were riots in Yerevan, the capital of Armenia, when this happened. But this was done so that Armenia is not involved in any land conflict or major land conflict, whereas it was over Nagano-Karabakh. And this was considered to have been done so that the doorway for Armenia to begin the, the process of entering NATO could occur. With a major land conflict, disputed territories couldn't get in. With that out of the way, it's possible that they could. So that's some of the reason for perhaps, perhaps why Pashinyan made this decision to just let go of this area. Um, the, so that, that was one big thing done last year. Another big thing that was done last year is that Armenia is a member of the CSTO, which is a common security treaty um, between Russia and Armenia and another, a number of other st uh, states in this area. Well, um, last year, Armenia was set to host that and host the military exercises, and they declined to host that and said they didn't see the point in having military exercises. At the same time, they engaged in the Eagle Partner military exercises with the United States. So in those exercises, um, these took place in September of last year, of 2023, some of the things that were involved in these exercises. Training of the Armenian 12th Peacekeeping Brigade of the Armed Forces of Armenia for future peacekeeping missions. Exchanging best practices in control and tactical communication. Fortifying interoperability and readiness via specialised peacekeeping operations training. And the exercise involved 85 US soldiers and approximately 175 Armenian soldiers. So reading into this, what this was is NATOfication of the Armenian armed forces. These are exercises taken place to work out the kinks and understand how the Azerbaijan, sorry, the Armenian forces could work cohesively with US and NATO forces. So adopting NATO communication protocols, getting familiar with NATO equipment. There are reports from Georgia that they have confirmed that France have been supplying Armenia with armored personnel carriers. So the US, as you can see, if we look at this map, you can see the strategic geopolitical importance of Armenia, where it sits with Israel just over here, Iran, the big bogeyman in this area for the United States, Armenia touches and has a border with Iran. And it's not that far from the capital of Tehran. So this means that if Armenia agrees to it, the United States and NATO can put forces and can put missiles into the southern tip of Armenia if they wish to and threaten Tehran and Iran further. So as the French look to put um, support in here as the Americans look to increase their military support with Armenia, as Armenia pulls out of Russian support deals, you can see that they are setting themselves up to be a Ukraine 2.0 here. They, they're setting themselves up to become a proxy US force in the region to either combat Iran or at least annoy and put pressure on Iran. Or you know, again, they're not that far from Russia. So again, if the US are now able to put missiles in here, well, they can then put missiles, you know, medium range missiles, which put Sochi within range. Now, Sochi is the summer capital for the, um, for the Russians and the Black see. So Armenia is one area um, that we want to watch. Now another one that is heating up, which had sort of gone quiet for a little while, but has started again, is Kosovo and Serbia. 
Yesterday, Kosovo celebrated its Independence Day. Now, Kosovo's independence is not recognised by Serbia. Uh, Kosovo has been a region of Serbia. Uh, however, in in the 1990s, the late 1990s, um, there were there was a, there was a war here. NATO actually entered this war on Kosovo's side and bombed the capital of Serbia, bombed Belgrade, killed about 1,200 Yugoslav forces and killed about 500 civilians in that bombing. Um, Kosovo, uh, it, it had its, its war for independence. Uh, it is majority ethnic Albanian people, and this is the challenge. However, the northern regions of Kosovo are a majority Serbian ethnic people and there is conflict in this area now there have been some there have been some skirmishes and fighting starting over the last six months to do with uh, at the end of last year uh, license plates Serbian license plates on cars traveling into northern Kosovo where it's ethnically majority Serbia the um, Pristina, the government of Kosovo, has started to clamp down on that and not allow vehicles in with certain Serbian number plates. So this obviously causes problems here. There was an election held in the northern regions here. A candidate was inserted by Pristina, a, um, a mayoral candidate that is Al ethnic Albanian or Kosovar, and the ethnic Serbians in that northern region rejected this. So when the when the mayoral vote was held, a tiny number of people turned out to vote, like a really small number of people. The ethnic Serbians just rejected the um, re boycotted the vote. What happened was because of the small number, the Kosovar, the Albanian uh, representative, won the vote. And Pristina enforced them taking the mayoral position. Now this caused problems. There were you know, there were protests around the courthouse and all of this sort of thing, as the Serbians said, "No, you're not enforcing this upon us. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're ethnic Serbians. We don't recognise Kosovo as being a separate state, and so we're not having this." So this caused troops to be moved from Serbia down to the border. It even caused uh, NATO. Now NATO has had a presence in Kosovo since the end of the conflict in 1999. They're called KFOR, the Kos um, Kosovo Forces, and they are a NATO multinational force uh, in Kosovo. And more of them were put into place uh, at that time. So tensions rose then. Now, just in the last couple of weeks, uh, Pristina, the leadership of Kosovo, has um, begun activities to you know, sort of finalise their independence and separation from Serbia, which has caused conflict in this northern region again, where they are now saying that the use of the Serbian dinar, the currency which has been accepted in Kosovo in this region, is no longer to be accepted. Um, Joseph, uh, Joseph Borrell, who's the EU's high representative for foreign affairs, has said these steps by Pristina are concerning because they are not contributing to the de-escalation of the situation. They are, um, they are not coordinated, they are unilaterally taken without the necessary level of prior consultation. Uh, Serbia's leader, Alexander Vucic, he has said the ban on the dinar was part of a wider policy to ethnically cleanse the Serbs from Kosovo, describing it as a criminal strike against the 100,000 100, strong minority. People are scared. They're waiting in lines to get their money, he said. Uh, so this is another region that we want to be just keeping an eye on now. Serbia are very friendly with Russia. And Vucic, the, uh, the Prime Minister, sorry, the President, has on a number of times spoken of his uh, support for Russia, his um, hesitancy in getting into sanctions against Russia. We have seen a number of reports from the front line from Russian troops. So this is the troops, so this is the unfiltered from the troops where they have been thanking Serbia for support in the conflict they have with Ukraine. And so Serbia here, you know, it's just to the west of Ukraine. This is Romania and Bulgaria and Ukraine is just next over there on the east. Um, 
So this is another area where these tensions are continuing to inflame. Um, and you know, the possibility of a conflict between Kosovo and Serbia, again, is, is certainly not out of the question, particularly now as things like this start to happen. Um, you can't use the currency anymore. You can't drive your cars here anymore. These are small, annoying steps, but there'll be building pressure in this region, and the likelihood of conflict starting is very high. Okay, so... Just the, um, I'm just going to finish off, finish off then, just going back to Ukraine and the, just go through the Ministry of Defence, the Russian Ministry of Defence, the updates for yesterday. So this was the, the, the last day of the collapse of of Divka. Uh, so the Russian Ministry of Defence says on the 17th of February. The centre group of forces have completely liberated, is their term, they've completely liberated Avdivka and advanced to a depth of 8.6 kilometres. The total area of the liberated territory was 31.75 square kilometres. The enemy losses were more than 1,500 troops. Now, so this is, this is reporting from the Russian Ministry of Defence. They are suggesting that... On February the 17th, the enemy losses were more than 1,500 troops. So that is a very large number, if that is correct. Um, that may well be correct. I, I can't say. The reason I'm saying it may well be correct is because in that last 24 hours, there was a collapse. There was chaos. There were Ukrainian troops with video. We have seen many of them retreating and still coming under attack, under heavy Russian shelling, FPV drone attack. There are reports from Russian sources yesterday after moving into these areas and looking at the escape routes that were being taken, that there were many bodies on the ground there. This number of 1,500 also isn't clear about what the term losses means, and this may include the reported 500 or so prisoners of war who have been captured. There are also reports of some of the 3rd Brigade third brigade troops having gone underground into tunnels underground and still being in the area. Now, they may all be contributing to this large number of 1,500. So this may not just be killed and wounded, which is the numbers we usually get from the Ministry of Defence when they report on Ukrainian losses. This may also include those troops who are trapped um, but still alive and those who have surrendered or been captured as prisoners of war, which I think is perhaps a more realistic number for what we might be seeing here. But just again, in quick summary, just along the front line, in Kupiansk, uh, fighting around uh, Sinkovka and even Ivanovka, reportedly 40 Ukrainian so servicemen killed or wounded yesterday. And we're seeing some heavy numbers here in terms of artillery losses. One Polish crab, now this is a self-propelled piece, two D-20 howitzers, two Godzikas, these are also self-propelled pieces, and one D-30 howitzer. So the loss of self-propelled artillery equipment is particularly problematic for Ukraine, as these give you some level of protection from Russian counter-battery strikes, in that you can fire artillery and then rapidly drive away and not be in the same location. In Krasny Laman, a lot of fighting still around uh, Yampolovka and Chervonaya Dbrova. In this area, 100 troops reportedly lost or killed or wounded. No reports of artillery in this area. Now, over the last couple of days, the reports from the Krasny Laman area in terms of artillery have been very low, which is interesting. I'm not quite sure what to make of that in that one area there. Um, perhaps there is a challenge in resupplying artillery equipment to the Ukrainians in this area for some reason. In the Donetsk area here, uh, now 400 troops reportedly lost an M star B, a D20, a D30 howitzer, as well as one Strela 10 surface to air missile system. There have been a growing number of reports of these Strela 10s being lost over the last couple of weeks. In South Donetsk, 190 troops, one Polish manufactured self propelled crab artillery system, a British FH 70, uh, two of those actually reported, two M Star B howitzers, and one Rapira anti tank gun has been destroyed. In the Kherson region, uh, 
Yeah, well, Hoa Son and Zaporozhia. It seems for some reason now that in the Ministry of Defence reporting, the Zaporozhia and Hoa Son figures are being combined. I don't know why that is, but in here it's saying the Hoa Son region, but it's talking about uh, Robotny and Verbova, which is in the um, Zaporozhia area. Um, the enemy losses here reported in the enemy because there's a Russian Ministry of Defence suggesting the losses are 70 servicemen, an M777 artillery system, a Gvodzika self-propelled howitzer, and an ANTPQ-48 counter-battery radar station. So overall, as I was saying, we have new fronts really opening up, not only in Ukraine, but Armenia somewhere to keep an eye on, Kosovo and Serbia somewhere to keep an eye on, and the Zaporozhia region looks like where we're going to see some sort of push and advance over the next few days. Okay, look, I thank you very much if you've watched this far. I hope you're enjoying the channel. Um, I hope you're having a, a good weekend if it's still your weekend, and I hope you have a great week. I look forward to talking to you soon. Mm -hmm.